Since there's been nothing to watch from Hollywood, I recently went to go see The Last Emperor in Taiwan's movie theaters. Having won the 1988 Academy Award for Best Picture, I had high expectations for it. I came into it looking for a unique movie-going experience. To be honest, my impressions of the film coming out of it in the end were mixed. There were some parts that I really enjoyed, but other parts definitely caught me a bit off guard. And when I began studying Pu Yi's story, I began to feel the same way about him. This video is a semi-review and a semi-historical video looking back at the last Qing Emperor's story. The Last Emperor is famous for being the first Western production allowed to film in the Forbidden City since 1949. It received the Chinese government's full support in doing so. As producer Jeremy Thomas explained in an interview with the Los Angeles Times, the Chinese helped them set up permits for filming, studios, and coordinating with the People's Liberation Army to provide 19,000 extras for a few majestic scenes. In return, the government got distribution rights for the movie and a few hundred thousand dollars to cover expenses. Thomas found that the Chinese government's involvement meant that traditional Hollywood studios stayed away from the film. He had to put up $400,000 of his own money in order to finance the screenplay and initial work to pitch the project. But based off that work, he was able to wrangle $25 million in alternative financing from merchant banks, who wanted a foot in the door to do business with China. Five banks in London, Stockholm, and other European cities would participate. It's interesting that China would open its doors to director Bernardo Bertolucci. He is a member of the West, but in the 1960s and 70s he had been close to the leftist movements led by the Italian Communist Party. In his youth, Bertolucci had shot a number of autobiographical films struggling with his bourgeois origins. He would keep close ties to the Italian Communist Party later in life, though it seems like he did not approve of the Maoist line of communism. When deciding what to film, Bertolucci brought to the Chinese government two proposals. The first would be an adaptation of the 1933 novel Man's Fate by Andre Marot. The book set in Shanghai follows the story of four protagonists attempting to overthrow Republican China. One attempts to assassinate Chiang Kai-shek, but fails and is killed. The others escape or commit suicide to prevent capture. Bertolucci thought that this storyline would be amenable to the Chinese, but communist officials turned it down. They felt that the storyline was too historically sensitive. For one thing, it depicted conflicts between real-life leaders like Chiang Kai-shek. Secondly, the communist revolutionaries failed in their goals, and the Chinese communist government preferred to see themselves win. Puyi's story was the second proposal, and the government liked that one. They would make a few corrections to the story, mostly relating to Chinese formalities, and remove one scene that they judged to be too demeaning towards the figure of the emperor. The last emperor's successful shoot would beget more successes. A few months after filming, Spielberg's 1987 film Empire of the Sun would also travel abroad to do a shoot there. The Last Emperor is based on the confessions of the Last Emperor Puyi. In the 1960s, Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai encouraged Puyi to write his autobiography. The work was done with the help of Li Wenda, an editor at the People's Publishing Bureau. The book takes after St. Augustine's own autobiography, Confessions, in that it tracks through the sins of a person's life before they reach a dramatic transformative life event. For Augustine, it was his conversion to Christianity. For Puyi, it was him entering the communists' reform program and becoming a working man. In this book, Puyi talks about his peculiar upbringing as the last emperor of China. It talks about his sins, like agreeing to be the head of the Manchu Guo state, and pins the blame for those sins to a poor education and that weird upbringing. He talks about his fear of death, drawing on the fates of past emperors from other dynasties like the Ming and the Tang. If you want to learn more about the last emperor of the Ming dynasty, I made a video about it earlier. And if you want to read about Puyi's entire life, you can read the voluminous Wikipedia page. There's been a lot of, I would say, controversies. Um, I think you'll enjoy that read. The autobiography is known for its historical inaccuracies and its skirting of the emperor's less amenable traits. For instance, it skips over the emperor's not so great treatment of his wife. Its goal was to gain the reader's sympathy for his difficult plight and the life up until now. The Last Emperor is a jarring film, especially when looking at it many years later. I think the first thing that I need to talk about is the fact that everyone speaks English in this movie. That includes the emperor himself and the ordinary Chinese people. For the Taiwanese who saw the movie with me, it distracted you from what was happening on the screen. 
Bertolucci talks about this as a deliberate choice. He used many native Chinese actors, for example, 2,000 PLA soldiers and 1,100 film students. The Chinese Vice Minister of Culture, Ying Ruocheng, plays the role of the prison governor. His character is, to say the least in my opinion, idealized. But he also cast Chinese American actors into roles. For example, Victor Wong has the politician Shen Baozhen, and they speak English. An ugly, accented English that makes me cringe internally. Many of these actors have native English ability. Victor is a fourth generation Chinese, American, and it's as good as mine, yet they cripple it. Bertolucci explains as such, There is a great deal of Chinese reality in the movie which gave me the confidence to use Chinese American actors. Let me repeat, I love contaminations and I love contradictions. I get the idea. I'm not really down with it, but that's just my personal opinion. This idea of contamination is a recurring theme in the movie. Has a viewer you get this feeling of being an unnatural presence in the film? A few critics mentioned that the film has uh, it repeats this oriental atmosphere that most Westerners seem to have when they look at the East, this sort of mysticism. And um, going back to the idea of contamination, most notably at the end, the movie abruptly shifts to a present time showing the modern-day Forbidden City and its status as a tourist destination. It leaves us with the feeling that we have visited some long-ago abstraction locked away many decades in the past. It's definitely weird, and it's definitely some kind of art, I, I guess. As I walked out of the theater, I thought to myself, I don't think a movie like that could be made in China today. I get the feeling that the China of the 1980s was more innocent and open to Western influences. They were coming off the Cultural Revolution and looking to distance themselves from it. They were much less media savvy. I doubt they give this much artistic leeway to make a movie like this today. It is a beautiful piece of work, this movie. For many people, it was the first time they ever got to see the Forbidden City clearly on a movie theater screen. It's a historical milestone in film collaboration between the East and the West. I appreciated it for that. But it's not a Marvel popcorn movie. It's not a crowd pleaser. It's a puzzling, weird thing. And I think uh, you will need to know that going in. And if you do know that, then I think you're going to be alright coming out. Alright everyone, have a good time, enjoy yourselves, take care of yourselves, stay safe out there.